this party started. Who had the great idea to put an economist first thing in the morning? That's a great idea, isn't it? Let's talk about things you care about, folks. Let's talk about all things that sometimes get in the way of us making great decisions. Now, this is Futuronomics, and I'm The Economist, and this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the facts and figures, real and raw, that matter to you and your teams. So this is me. This is the slide. This is how we're going to go. Folks, the world right now is in crisis. I don't know if you've noticed this, but many of the crises we're experiencing right now can be categorized either as global crises, economic crises, workplace crises, or domestic crises. I focus mostly on the economics and the workplace. I can't control global things. I can't control a lot of domestic things. So these are the things that we need to pay attention to right now. At any time, you folks at home, if you are watching from your office or you're live streaming right now, if you've got questions and I'm not addressing them, please put them into the app. Please ask the questions, and I will get to them as quickly as possible. So as we ask questions moving forward, we, we think about things like, how are our businesses affected by world events? Does it matter for us? And what should we be paying attention to? Are we in a recession? Let me answer that question. Yes. Yes, we're in a recession. Any of you who ever had basic economics 101, two successive quarters of negative GDP makes a recession. You can call it anything else you want. Um, that's just the definition. You may not like it. You may not want to believe it, but that's it. We are in a recession. And then what challenges do we and the people around us have right now that deal with economic issues? And how do we get the people around us to do what we know they need to do? And this becomes a leadership challenge. So your value, I think, is in the center of these circles. Your value starts, of course, with the people side. So the people, and I like to use acronyms. It's a military thing. I know I'm not the only military veteran in the room. So very quickly, where are my other military veterans? Where are my army people? Former army people, yeah, there we go, good. One, there's one army person? Only one, are you serious? Look, I, I know you don't like raising your hand, that's okay. By the way, I taught school for 30 years and you people in the back, when I look at you and you look down, I can still see you. <laughs> Wanna point that out, army guy, what'd you do? Infantry, Infantry. excellent, good. Where are my fellow Navy people? Navy people, yes sir, what'd you do? Service, Service warfare. warfare, what ship? The Rosie and the Lincoln, very nice. Thank you so much. Grad, Navy? OK, fantastic, good. Any other Navy people? I know, asking auditors to raise their hand in the morning. They told me it was risky. I got this. Any Air Force people? Air Force people, yes, sir. What'd you do? Aircraft electrician on what platform? C-130s, nice. Old, slow, cold, love it. And people complain about Frontier Airlines now. I'm like, oh, yeah, OK, there's that. Good, where are my Marines? Yeah, I've got a couple of them. You almost always hear them before you see them. They're stealthy, our Marines. What did you do in the Marine Corps, sir? Tank commanders. Tank commanders. By the way, if you've, that's a bad way to die. Like, good that you didn't. I mean, that's a really bad way. That's a quick way. It's a, oh, it's really bad. Like, there's physics involved. It's super bad. What did you do in the Marine Corps, sir? Radio operator. OK, that was a fun thing. When I go to Quantico, they're like, we need somebody to volunteer to carry the radio. I'm like, I like music. That was a very bad trick they played on me. The, the, how much does that thing weigh? Well, I had a variety of ones, but one was like 50 like 50 pounds. They're like, you get to carry the radio. I was like, that wasn't what I was expecting. All right, so in the military, we use acronyms for things, to remember things. And I'm going to give a hat tip to my Army friends right now. On the people side, it is armed. How do we attract? Recruit and retain, mentor, manage, evolve, and develop our current and next generation of leaders. And how do we help them know what they need to do? And then on the technology and tool side, how are we advancing? What are we innovating? Where are we putting our scarce resources? A couple months ago, I got to do a conference in Vegas, and the opening speaker was Damon John, you know, like Damon John, Shark Tank guy, right? And the closing speaker was Charles Payne, the finance guy. And the middle speaker was Mary Kelly. It was a good day for Mary Kelly. And they were both talking about cryptocurrency. And I thought, well, I should get some of that. So I did. And then it tanked. And I thought, well, good job, Mary, getting ahead of that curve. But I'm not worried about my retirement funds. I have Beanie Babies for that. There we go. 
How are we making sure that we're using the right technology and techniques and tools to move forward? And then how do we manage the uncertainty of the people around us? And there's a lot of uncertainty. If you watch the news, it is very, very easy to get distracted by things that don't matter and things you can't control. We have to manage the uncertainty. Where are my people with dogs? I can see you, so you can raise your hand, and I promise not to call you if you have dogs, dog people. Dog people, okay, good. When there's a big thunderstorm, you dog people, what does your dog want to do? Be on the couch with you. They want to be cuddling with you. They want pat head, hold paw, managing the uncertainty. Um, what about you cat people? Where are the cat people? I have no idea what you do with a cat. <laughs> I just have no idea, but I wanted you to feel good about yourself, so I mentioned the cats. <laughs> And then how do we grow our businesses? How do we figure out what we do next? How do we strategize? How do we optimize? How do we find the opportunities? This does not mean being opportunistic. It means looking at shifts and crises and saying, you know what, we've got the solutions for that issue. So how do we figure that out? How do we help? And in the center of this, of course, is value. Now, your people are still dealing with uncertainties. They're still, still dealing with this. Um, People are still getting sick from this. People are worried about new technologies and whether or not they are ahead of the curve. I would like to encourage you to get ahead of the curve. Help your folks automate in the best possible way. We've also got to worry about cybersecurity. If you're sitting in this room right now and you're not losing a little bit of sleep over cybersecurity, I would say that you probably should. Because to me, cybersecurity is a question, it's not a question of if it's going to happen, it is when it is going to happen. You're going to get hacked. The question is, are you equipped to deal with what happens afterwards? Here's what's scary to me. Lloyd's of London, three weeks ago, came out and said, if they insure you for cyber issues, ransomware, hacking, all of that, and they determine the hack came from a state-sponsored entity, that they determine they don't have to pay. Think about that for a second. Other insurers will follow suit. Over 90% of the hacking is state-sponsored. So all of a sudden, your precautions have to be even greater. So we've got this zero trust idea. And many of you hear this at work all the time, and many of you beat the drum, and you say, please don't click on the link. And then like toddlers going for the stove, don't touch the stove because it's hot. People touch the link. So let's see how trusting you are today. Go ahead, scan it. Go ahead, scan it. No? No. <laughs> Zero trust. All right, we haven't gotten the trust there. This is going to contain the vault of materials I'm sharing with you today. I know that as an economist, people are like, really, economists share details. Yes. This contains the leader's blind spot assessment. It has the 12-month business success and accountability planner. It's got a series of 15-minute plans that address today's issues in the workplace. And there's a little bit of economics in there. It's about, uh, there's a couple ebooks as well. There's just a great vault of resources. And again, nobody's picking up their phones, so yeah, zero trust. Okay, good job, you. Good job. So let's get to the economy. GDP. How's the economy right now? Well, the economy right now is made up, as, as many of you, like you're, I'm going to put this formula up and it's going to give some of you a little bit of nausea because you remember your class. And if, uh, by the way, anybody ever have an econ class? It's a pretty safe bet with auditors. Okay. Anybody, was it your favorite class ever? Like two people. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Two people. Anybody hate it? Who hated econ? Where are my people? Yes! So, and you're still here this morning. You're very brave. I love that. By the way, the reason you hated econ was because you just had teachers who uh, were teaching old school stuff. We all practice economics on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just resource allocation. If you've ever gone shopping, that's economics. So let's talk about that. It's our C plus I plus G plus our exports minus our imports. The C is our consumer expenditures. This is the stuff you and I spend on a day-to-day -day basis. And in normal times, it makes up about 70% of our overall GDP. The United States, by the way, enjoys the highest amount of GDP in the world. Um, number two is China. India just overtook the UK, by the way, for fifth place. I mean, like right this week, they just overtook the UK. Part of that is also because the dollar valuation with their currencies have impacted that a little bit, but India has increased their production, their goods and services, and they have now overtaken the UK. The C should be, like I said, about 70%. The I is business investment. This is the stuff that your organizations spend. The G is our government expenditures. We're in DC, there's a lot of government expenditures. In normal times, it should be 16 to 17%. Right now, because of the last couple of years, it is over 31%. That is a problem. 
during COVID, our federal government spent, on average per citizen, 333 million of us-ish, $32,000 per citizen under the guise of COVID and COVID relief. How many of you would have rather taken the check? I'll just take the check, please. I'll buy my own mask. Thank you very much. So because of that, then our net exports, we add this all together, then our net exports, our exports minus our imports is our net exports. It matters a whole lot less than most people think when our exports decrease or, in, or increase. Our exports, of course, are also a function of our dollar valuation. Right now, the dollar is strong. When the dollar is strong, our exports suffer a little bit because then our goods and services are a little bit more expensive to our foreign partners. So the economy is a little bit concerning, and here's why. Because we are overspending right now, and because of the overspending, you can't take all this, in, all this cash and throw it out in the economy and not expect prices to go up. That's what happens. When you've got too few goods being chased by too many dollars, the prices go up. Um, by the way, I grew up in Texas, and some of y'all are making me feel really comfortable, like church on Sunday, because you're hanging out in the back, standing up, and there's all these seats up front. You're welcome, you're welcome. They're like, yeah, we don't like that at all. So let's talk about fiscal policy. This is what the government does, and by government I mean your elected officials. Fiscal policy is taxing and spending, taxing and spending, taxing and spending. Say it with me, taxing and spending, everybody, taxing and spending. Okay, I'll take it, that, that was fantastic. Fiscal policy is when the government, your elected officials, decide to impose taxes. Now, when taxes go up, it slows down the economy. When we decide to spend more money, that G goes up, it stimulates the economy. So right now, we've got the government playing tug of war with fiscal policy. We are increasing taxes and we're increasing spending, which means we're having a stagnating effect from fiscal policy. So this is a little bit problematic. But then we've got monetary policy, which many of you are familiar with. This is the Federal Reserve, this is Mr. Powell, this is all his friends, they're meeting today and tomorrow. And between today and tomorrow, they're gonna, just, they're gonna spend two full days, and I'm pretty sure today they're all going, so what, what are we gonna do tomorrow? I don't know, let's have coffee first. Let's have coffee, they already made the decision. One of the great questions we uh, just got in the poll is, is it gonna be 75 or 100 basis points tomorrow? Most of us agree it's gonna be at least 75, if not 100 by tomorrow, I'm counting on 75. Some people are saying that Mr. Powell is going to want to send a stronger message because the inflationary numbers continue to increase in certain sectors. Um, I, think it's, I think it's probably just going to be 75. Now, if you are in the business of loaning out funds, this makes a very big difference to you. Keep in mind, the Fed has three, pol three policy tools that they can use in order to slow down the economy, which is what they're supposed to be doing right now. But keep in mind, we just stopped the quantitative easing in the spring. So before that, we spent three years shoving money into the economy, again, to stimulate growth. And now, all of a sudden, we're increasing interest rates, which is designed to slow the economy. What we're not touching right now is the required reserve ratio, which is the amount of money that banks financial institutions have to have on hand as cash or with the Fed to make sure that if there's a run on banks, it's not gonna be a problem. So they're ignoring that, which is good, but they've been throwing this money out into the economy. But um, the technique there is to buy and sell government treasuries or bonds. Uh, with this quantitative easing, we can also just throw this money into the economy and then raising the interest rates, as you all know. So again, they're playing tug of war with monetary policy too. So this is a bit of a problem. The interest rates that you're all concerned about is something to be concerned about, unless you already bought your house in the past several years, unless you don't need an auto loan and you don't need a business loan. If you don't need a loan right now, you don't care so much about interest rates, unless you do. So this is the yes, no, maybe question for tomorrow. It's probably gonna be 75. Uh, back in the spring, when they talked about even imposing a 0.5% increase, you know, 50 basis points, people got very excited. Now it's 75 and people are like, yeah, whatever. So it looks like we're gonna get our federal funds rate um, Right now, you know, over 3.25, easy. It's gonna go up again next month, probably go up again in November. Um, I think it's gonna to continue to go up into the summer of 2023, and, uh, and then we're gonna adjust from there. Because right now, the inflationary pressures we're seeing are not slowing down, and this is the concern. And your people are really concerned about money right now, too.
The people who work for you, keep in mind the average wage and salary in the United States is $36.32. That comes out to be a little bit under $69,000 a year, which is not terrible if there's more than one person working in a household. But think about trying to make it on just that, and it makes you worried about your particular budget. This is where a lot of you come in. If you are the folks with um, my ladies in the back, um, you deal with investments, and people need you now more than ever. Your people, your customers, your consumers need to know what to do, because as, this, as, the, as the news makes big deals of this, your people become more and more concerned and you've got to manage that uncertainty. And your people are worried about their finances. So how bad is it? Well, as of this morning, this is how the S&P 500 has done since the beginning of the year. And if you look at this graph, this graph, this only goes back to January of 2021. And if you see, we're pretty much at where we started in January of 2021. And for the year, we're down 17.23%. Now, the lowest point was in June of this year. Many people say, well, are we at the bottom yet? A lot of people thought the bottom was in June. That was a good time to buy in case you market time. I don't advise that, but we all do it, let's face it. I think we've still got some rocky stock market days ahead because the Dow Jones is not a whole lot better. The Dow Jones generally does lag uh, the index, the S&P 500 index. So this is only down by 14.64%. It started off worse yesterday morning. It got better uh, by the close yesterday afternoon. And again, we've got that same, those same dipping points. Where to be concerned is the NASDAQ. Um, NASDAQ is down by year since the beginning of this year by 26.76%. That's a lot. So when your customers call you and say, hey, I just watched my retirement portfolio because I don't have the Beanie Babies. I've got my retirement portfolio that's down by 25% and you go, yeah. Um, a better response is, okay, so let's look hard at where your investments are and what we need to be focused on. What, the, what do the fundamentals look like and where are we going? So when we look at our CPI um, and we're trying to measure the inflation, you can see where some of the dips are. So the blue line is everybody in all cities, and then the red line uh, takes out food. Now, what we all care about food. I especially care about food. So every time they say, we're just going to ignore food and transportation and fuel, I'm like, what? What? Why would we do that? That makes no sense to me at all. So here's what the numbers look like. What's interesting to me is, and again, the way we measure this from your Econ 101 class is we have these market baskets. Like we go shopping at Walmart in Manhattan, Kansas. And then we go shopping in Dallas, Texas. And then we go shopping in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And we put together this market basket of things and we try to measure that against where it was a year before. Now certain things like computers have deflationary pressures because computers have gotten better and the costs have gone down. So when we look at this, we have to understand that these are lagging indicators. By the time people collate this data and publish it, there is a lag. So people got very excited back in February when it looked like, and we all knew it was over 8%, but nobody wanted to say 8. Nobody wanted to say it. We all knew it was over 8. And all of a sudden, then, then things heated up, and then in June it was over 9. And now it's back down to 8.3. Now this doesn't sound good unless you compare us, everything's relative, to the United Kingdom. In the UK right now, inflation is about 18%. In Turkey, it's over 80%. Fuel in Europe right now, I don't know if you've got friends in Europe, has increased 10 times in the past 18 months. So the whole Russian invasion of Ukraine, not cool. Did it impact energy? Yes, it did. It drove up prices. And when that, but not, not as much as we are necessarily being told. Uh, our oil prices in our country, and we have enough oil and natural gas in our country for the next 2,041 years. After 2,042 years, I'm going to start getting worried. So the energy issues that, that we've got are largely of our own making. Only 3% of all of our gas, our petroleum products, came in as petroleum products, not gas from Russia. And again, part of that is the Jones Act that, again, we did that to ourselves. It is more expensive to ship oil from Houston to New York than simply bring it across the pond. So again, we've, we've done that to ourselves with our own regulations. But here's what's interesting to me about inflation. See these numbers here? Bacon. Look, bacon, up by 20%. Um, look at eggs. Look at vehicles, rentals. 
Folks, these were numbers from a year ago, November. See, inflationary pressures had already started. So we can't blame these things on Russia, which is what some people are trying to do. Um, we have to be looking hard at the trend of pricing. So when you think about the fact that the average wage has only increased by 5.6%, unless you're in hospitality or transportation, and then it's about 15%. But when you think about the average government wage at 3%, the average corporate wage has only gone up by 5.6%, and then you, think, you look at prices like this, and no wonder people are feeling squeezed. And then supply chains. We all got familiar with supply chains during this whole thing. And it has to do with everything that we did. So how many of you wound up doing a little bit of working from home during this whole time? Working from home a little bit? Anybody work from home? Good. So I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. I'm walking around again. I know it makes you very nervous. How many of you, when you were working from home, decided you suddenly hate your house? And you said, you know what? I've seen those guys on HGTV, those brothers, you know? And they managed to flip an entire house in like a weekend, all by themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you said, I can do that with my house. So one, one desperate Friday, and there could have been tequila, I don't know, I don't know, could have been tequila, you decided to take a sledgehammer to the cabinets in your kitchen. And you took it sledgehammer, and all of a sudden you realize, well, if I'm going to take out the cabinets, I should take out the countertops too. They're old and they look terrible, that orange laminate stuff from the 1970s. Don't know what we were thinking, that in the avocado cabinets. You took a sledgehammer. And then you said, well, gosh, if I'm going to do this, I need a new refrigerator. Now, if I'm going to get a new refrigerator, I need a new stove and a new sink and the, all the new door pulls and all the things. And then you've got to rip out the floor. And you think, but that's OK, because the guys on HGTV can do this in a weekend. I should be able to do this in like a month. <laughs> Wrong. Because they were not dealing with some of the supply chain issues, see, that you were doing, because that's the only problem in this scenario. Folks, we're all excited because right now the, the glut of ships in the Pacific Ocean is down to just about four days. Four days. And we're all very proud of ourselves, because 40% of everything that comes into the United States comes in through the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. Second to that is New York. Third, fighting for third place, Charleston is trying to take over Savannah. Third place of what's coming into the country. And so we're very excited because this is down to like four days. Yay us. Except here's the problem. That's not where your refrigerator is. Your refrigerator is in the other part of the Pacific Ocean, the part that is off the coast of Shanghai, where each of these yellow dots is a merchant ship with your refrigerator on it. And there's over 500 ships right now waiting to be offloaded and onloaded in Shanghai. And because they've got a zero COVID issue, right now they put another 21 million people under COVID lockdown. This is creating a glut. So a great question, are current energy policies good for the economy? It's a question that came in. No, and um, I will get to that in just a second. No, the answer is no. We need to encourage natural gas, we need to encourage oil, and we need to encourage exploration. We can be energy, we can be energy independent, and we should be. Can we get rid of coal? The answer is yes. Is it going to be immediate? The answer is no. We still have about 50 operating coal plants in the United States. So that's what's operating in the United States. And again, we're the top GDP in the world. Hang on. China is building another 1,000 coal plants. So we can get rid of ours, and it's not going to make any difference in what's going on with the planet. India is building another 800. So coal remains a very viable option for energy in other places. What's actually clean for us, my opinion, nuclear energy. Germany shut down all their nuclear power plants because they thought it was bad. And for any of us who've ever worked in nuclear power, we find it to be very clean, pretty cost effective. The initial outlay is quite expensive, but it does burn clean. One of the big emergency responses that we had in the Navy is if the power goes down, you bring in a submarine and you plug it in. You can power up a whole city. So um, it's, a, it's a good question. So housing, let's get into housing. If you bought a house in the last couple of years, good for you because your loan rates were low. If you're looking at buying a house moving into the future, you'll find housing prices are continuing to go up for a variety of reasons. First, regulation. 
40% of all of the costs associated with a new build in the United States are directly tied to regulatory requirements for that new build. The second problem, how many of you have kids who are electricians? Anybody? Who's got a plumber in the family? Nope. Who's got a drywaller? Anybody? Anybody lay concrete? Yeah, your kids would get voted right off the island, wouldn't they? We need some useful skills, people, useful skills. We are having trouble with our immigration, which is a lot of our H2B workers, so construction companies have really suffered by not being able to bring in the labor they need. And again, we did some of it to ourselves. A lot of our lumber comes in from Canada. It's our number one place where we get lumber in the United States. And a year ago, our tariffs on lumber coming in from Canada was about 8%. Now it's at 18%. That tax on 10% costs just on the lumber, for example. So the cost of construction materials has gone up. A lot of the materials are doing donuts in the Pacific Ocean. That causes delays. And shipping containers coming over from China with the rest of our stuff for to build our houses. Remember, at the very beginning of COVID, a shipping container, a 40-foot shipping container, cost about $2,000. During the height of COVID, officially, it was only $27,000. That's a very big increase. Now it's down to about $7,000. It's gotten better. Now there's been a lot of mergers in the merchant ship world, which has driven this as well. But the housing costs have gone up, and the supply is only at about 10% of available homes for what we actually need. So this is problematic. In some areas, the housing market is hotter than others, as many of you know. Um, because of the work from home momentum, people now realize they could work in Manhattan, Kansas, instead of Manhattan, New York, where things were cheaper. So many people did make that move. Single family, multifamily starts um, started to come back, and then they slowed down again. So this is problematic to me. Um, jobs, let's talk about jobs for just a second. Where the jobs are, um, I want you to uh, take a good hard look at the people in this room. Go ahead, look left, look right. You're not going to talk to them, don't worry. Look left, look right, good. You know what you see in this room? Baby boomers. Where are my baby boomers? My self-declared baby boomers. Where are you baby boomer people? Come on, be proud, be proud. Baby boomers, like three people. Okay, all right, you're optimistic. I, they told me you could do math, okay. Where are my Gen Xers? Gen Xers, where are we? Woohoo, Gen Xers! Have you noticed nobody cares about us at all? Nobody at all. <laughs> nobody cares. Good. Where are my Millennials? Millennials, woohoo! Excellent. Tell all your friends to go get a job. <laughs> and my Gen Zers, do I have any Gen Zers? Like one person? Okay, if you find the Gen Zer, like hang on to them, hire them, like keep them, like keep them tucked into your pocket, like hang on to them. So where the jobs are, folks, the top 20 jobs moving into the future are not surprisingly in healthcare. Healthcare. And it's everything from full-on physicians. Right now, there's more specialties in the physician world. We need more specialties. We need more medical personnel. There is a shortage of medical personnel. We are not cranking out enough nurses, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, and doctors. We are in desperate short of nurses. Of the, 44%, of the 44 percentage of people who left their health care job in the past two years, 44 percent of them are not going back into health care. They're leaving the health care industry for a variety of reasons. Burnout is part of it. Um, some people simply don't like it anymore, but we need more of them than ever. So if you don't want your kid to be an electrician or a plumber, think about the healthcare world. I know what you're thinking, but Mary, I want my kid to go into finance. I know, but here's where jobs are. A few other things. So then we've got this great resignation where four million people every single month for the past 18 months have said, you know what, I quit. Let me share something with you. They quit and you haven't noticed. For some of them, they needed to be fired anyway. So they saved you the bother. For some of them, you have not noticed. For many of my senior leaders, they say, but Mary, we can't hold our people accountable because we're so worried that they're going to quit on us. I'm like, hang on. I recently called up a computer company and I said, hey, I've got a question about this product after staying on hold for 35 minutes and the person on the other end said, wait, we make those? 
If you've got bad workers, it's worse than having workers at all. Not only that, but the people who quit, sometimes they did it for very legitimate reasons. In some areas, schools will shut, were shut down, and they didn't have a choice. All of a sudden, you know, when you work at a fast food restaurant, you gotta be there. You can't do remote work. And all of a sudden, your kids are home from school, and you had to quit, because there was simply no childcare. One out of every seven people who did quit their jobs started their own business. Folks, it's real easy to start a business. It's far more difficult to grow a sustainable business. But the other part of this is this means four million people every month are willing to take a chance on you. And you could be better than what they had before. Salary attracts, benefits entice, and flexibility in your leadership keeps them in those jobs. And many people left their jobs because they thought the grass was gonna be greener somewhere else. Now coming in here today, I flew out of Colorado. Where are my Colorado people? Grass means something different there. <laughs> so when we think the grass is greener, I'm just saying. So we think the quit, the quit rates have probably peaked. Because all of a sudden, when the economy started to shrink back again a little bit, and all of a sudden there's an announcements of layoffs, people say, whoa, maybe I better hang on to the job I've got. Maybe I need to be better at work. Maybe I need to be more productive. So unemployment is still very low at 3.7%. We think, of course, that the Fed is going to increase. They're measuring all kinds of variety of, of, of variables in the economy when they're looking at whether or not to raise interest rates and what we're gauging as a healthy pace. Keep in mind that at 3.7% unemployment, that's, that's basically below full employment. Here's the big secret on that. For a lot of people who are working remotely, they have another full-time job. 19% of the people who are working remotely have another full-time remote job. And this is why they don't turn on their cameras. They're not being shy. They're not saying, oh, I didn't do my hair. No, they've got another full-time job. And because your managers haven't been paying attention to the quality of work and the accountability, nobody has noticed. And the reason we know this is because the labor force participation rates. We're like, hang on, the numbers don't add up. So historical levels, if we go back to 2000, this is about what this looks like. We need more people in the workforce. We need more millennials and Gen Zers in the workforce. And the labor force participation rate jumped up just a wee bit to 62.4%, so that's good. Again, we need more people in the labor force. In the labor force means you've got a full-time job, a part-time job, or you're actively seeking work. So where did this extra, extra bodies come from? Well, people did wind up retiring uh, especially the folks who are over 55, and then they're coming back into the workforce. There's a couple reasons for that. First, they're worried about the economy. The second thing is they all of a sudden realized, I miss work. The third thing is, for, for those of you who have children between the ages of 18 and 29, there's a 53% chance that they live with you. Tell them to get out of the house. Unless it's your retirement plan. And if it's your retirement plan for them to take care of you and they're actually doing this, then maybe that is a possibility. But for those of you here, please don't discount some of our older workforce participants simply because they are not what you thought you were hiring for before. And in fact, we find that the over 55 crowd does tend to have a better, well, show up rate. They're showing up and they've got job skills, so they're coming back in. Um, is it already too late to address global warming? The question came in. I used to work at the Air Force Academy. I did 10 years there. And in the weird way that the, the military structures things, the Department of Economics was paired with geosciences. So I had all the geoscience people and the GIS people and all of that. I think we need to do our very best to save the planet. And I think it be, can be done sustainably. And I think we don't need to necessarily get all um, crazy about certain things. But I think we do need to pay attention to things like regular pollution and um, fuels and things like that. Um, so wages and salaries. Let's talk about wages and salaries for just a minute. As I mentioned, the average wage is about $36.32, uh, $36 um, and that has gone down a little bit. So I do think that's gonna rise back up again next year. Here's what a lot of my clients did in 2022. Because of rising taxes, what they also did was they said, you know what, hey, inflation is happening. Um, here's a $500 gift card. So it was a gift. It was under that magical number, 
So they're just showing some appreciation to some of their folks to help them get over some of these inflationary numbers. Here's what's interesting to me. The wage growth gap is large, and the, where it's large is if you're in a job right now and you only saw that 5.6% on average wage increase, that's one thing. But if you quit and you go to another job, they're going to pay you about 8 to 9% more than what you were getting before. Okay, so this, this to me is a very big red flag for leaders and managers of organizations. Hang on. So you're telling me that your loyal people, the people who have stuck with you this whole time, you're appreciating them less paycheck-wise than the person you're hiring in off the street, and they go, uh-huh, okay. Then there's those people who left the job, they went, thought the grass was greener, not the Colorado ones, they thought the grass was greener, and now they want to come back to their job. Now, if they had to leave because of, say, a childcare issue, or they had to care for aging parents, or something, like there was a need for them to not be in your workspace, I can see that. But some people just, they say, well, I just, I just thought it would be better somewhere else, and now I want to come back, because I realize working for you is actually quite good. See, that to me is like marrying your ex-wife again. <laughs> I wouldn't get excited about that. Um, so the wage gr uh, gap is large for the people who leave and then come in. Um, so that's just something to pay attention to. And then population growth by state. I thought you might be interested to know where there is more growth as a percentage. Now, some of you did your part, um, and I'm excited about that. How many of you had COVID babies? Who had COVID babies? Yes, you had good job, you, good job. One person, oh, you had a COVID baby too? Good job, you. Okay, did you have a boy child or a girl child? Boy. A boy. What did you have, ma'am? Did you have one too? You had a boy too, that's awesome. Okay, what'd you have, ma'am? A boy too, wow, we make boys apparently as auditors. Good, okay, okay, there's that. What'd you have, ma'am? You had a girl, that's awesome. So um, four people in this crowd had COVID babies. Okay, we are not gonna win, oh, okay, five. Okay, thank you, yes, six, okay. Folks, we are not gonna win the population war if you don't start having babies. For some of you, I realize this ship may have sailed. <laughs> However, when we think about the population shifts, and some of you are looking at this map thinking, geography, I'm not really sure where I do live. Uh, maybe I have moved. Think about where states are and how this looks when we think about where the growth is. I just thought you might find it an interesting metric. Now, consumer confidence, for those of you who had children, um, are they cute? Cute, so cute. Yeah, that's a lawyer question. You never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Hmm. Um, yeah, we need more of you people, smart people, beautiful people, to have more babies. Okay, yeah, apparently that's not going to be a rallying cry. I get this, all right. Uh, so consumer confidence. Some people are worried about having children um, because, well, consumer confidence is down. This is the University of Michigan index. Consumer confidence is the lowest it has been in time. Since they started measuring this back in the 60s, it is the lowest it's ever been. People do not feel good about the economy. Um, so there's a good one. Our rising costs in the education, increasing requirements for educations by jobs, creating labor force shortages. Are there any reforms coming? That is a really good question. So having been a professor, I'm going to uh, answer that question because I think it's really important. And you people at home, just keep the questions coming. I worried when I was a professor because I watched other professors never worked in the industry teaching from the same textbook they were taught from 25 and 30 years before. They were not advancing. I watched people graduate with marketing degrees who had no idea what current marketing initiatives were. I watched people with finance degrees not know anything about new software, new techniques, and new regulations. I think we in the higher education world have done a terrible job of preparing young people and those of us who are not so young when we went back to get graduate degrees for the real world. And that concerned me a lot. What also concerns me is this idea that some people don't think their degrees are worth paying for. If you don't think your degree is worth paying for, why should I pay for it too? My opinion. It's not going to be popular with some of you, I get that. So we've got to be doing a better job demanding higher education, holding them accountable for the outcomes we want for those students. What does that look like? And by the way, I spent 25 years in the military. I am apolitical. I do not like politics. I stay out of politics. There is a reason that I don't work for any of your institutions, um, because I just don't have to uh, worry so much about things that, that I say. Um, 
I'm really glad you laughed there because that could have gotten me into a lot of trouble. Um, so um, are, will wider adoption of corn dog model positively impact corporate profits or ESG or more? I think that's a bigger topic than this economic stuff. Um, good ESG can increase profits. If you do it poorly, it's going to cost you a bunch of money. It's just going to be throwing money down a toilet. Um, so do it right. That's a big part of that. Um, and so I've got, they put these things on the, on the screen. For bank earnings, will, we prop, will positive benefits from increased interest rates outweigh the drag from a slower economy? In the long run, the answer is yes. Um, people ask me all the time where I invest, and I realize for you people who actually deal with investments, um, I, I do like nuclear energy. I like other energy. I like fintech. I still love, I still love financials because we rely on you. Uh, the economy is going to continue. In five years, you're going to say, I wish I'd invested in what? And that's where you put the money now, I, I think. A de decrease in consumer sentiment doesn't seem to correlate to consumer spending like it did in prior downturns. Okay, so... Thank you for asking that. This is my concern. During COVID, we had this excess cash and we spent it. Now, we don't have the excess cash. And in fact, we have spent over $50 billion on credit cards in the last four months paying for things that we need like transportation and food. So when you see this, and you might see this in your credit card statements and, and your borrowing and all of that, there's gonna be more borrowing. And now, during COVID, people bought stupid stuff, like really expensive bicycles that went nowhere. I'm just, you know, you can go outside and walk. I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, it's a possibility. But we spent money on stupid stuff because we had all this excess cash and we didn't have that many things to spend it on. We couldn't go, we couldn't go to baseball games or ballet or, the, or you know, the opera or whatever we were spending money on. We couldn't go to those things. So we had this pent up money for leisure activities. And then we figured out where to put this. Well, now we don't feel like we've got that pent up money. And what my concern is, is that normally heading into the fall, we rely on Santa Claus to solve a lot of problems. We count on the holidays, the holiday spending, the holiday travel. Uh, we didn't have as much travel this summer. Once the price of gasoline went up, people pulled back on their travel plans. Uh, the cost of airlines tickets were going up by about 8% a month starting last March and April. That has slowed down slightly, so this is a little bit. So real personal consumer expenditures um, did take a dip because also we couldn't, there was nothing in the stores anyway. Uh, ships were sitting there with all the stuff we wanted to buy, and now if you look in the stores, they're still getting in summer clothes. We haven't even gotten in some of the winter, fall clothes yet, so we, are, we do have this gap, and that means there's less to choose from. There's simply less inventory. Um, then we get into our corporate CEO conference uh, confidence, and this is interesting to me because the people who measure this, it is the chief executive network. It is compri it's, um, it's comprised of about 300,000 CEOs who subscribe to the magazine, take the surveys, and then a couple um, hundred, a thousand of those folks get together every November for a conference and they talk about CEO things. Here's what worries me. Their consumer confidence level is down. As CEOs, manufacturing CEOs, their confidence level is down, which means that business investment, that C plus I plus G, that I, that is going down as well. So that is a concern. They're pulling back. They are laying people off. They are cutting costs. And this is going to uh, slow the economy. So that's, that's the issue. Um, will the size of the national debt slow the growth of the US long term? <gasps> oh, whoever asked that question, mwah, love you so, so much. Um, let me get through energy, and then let me show you. So the energy factor looks like this. Our global energy requirements have gone up over time, and this kind of makes sense. But they've gone up by a lot the last couple of years for, again, a variety of reasons. We've made it more expensive to go find it. We are using more energy as a planet. We just are. And when you look at where the money comes, where the energy comes from, excuse me, so on your far left, that is the world energy consumption as of yesterday. Yesterday. So the top country consuming energy uh, right now and it kind of makes sense, is of course China, and then we're number two, then India. And then that middle column, that is the US energy consumption by type. And it's not, it's not ranked because to the right of it, it's world energy production by type. So natural gas, that's production on the far right. The middle column is what we use in the United States. So you can see, if you've never seen this before, it comes from uh, usdebtclock.org. There's a tab for uh, energy. And whenever I feel cheerful, I've got it on my watch, on my Apple watch. And so whenever I feel cheerful, I just look at this. And there's just all kinds of data that makes you sad. 
yeah, so there's that. Um, so you can see for the world, look at where natural gas is and then look at where coal is. See, our coal is kind of that drop in the coal bucket. And then we look at uh, where other sources are coming from. And I love the idea of solar panels. Uh, I've got them you know, at, at a house. Uh, it's a good idea, and it saves money, and that's great. But overall, that doesn't really generate that much. Uh, hydroelectric, not so much. Biofuse, not so much. Wind, not so much. Um, and we just decided uh, to spend another $50 million putting windmills in the middle of the ocean to try to generate electricity. Yeah, I, I can't see how this is going to turn out well, but um, I'm sure it's creating jobs for somebody. So if you look at the top four, this is where the energy comes from. And this is what we spend. And for a lot of people who never uh, focus on energy, this to me is a very big deal. Um, and by the way, you're, um, we're going to make all the slides available to all of y'all so that um, you, know, you can go home and be sad. Yeah, there's that. So let, let's look at the national debt. I am one of the very few economists who thinks the national debt is bad. I think it's very bad. How bad is it? How bad is it? It's so bad. Um, so here's again what it was yesterday. And I'd like to kindly, I realize this is a terrible slide, especially if you're looking at it, don't worry. I'm going to blow it up a little bit for you. But these are all the things that US debt clock has for you. And it's our tax revenue, and it's our revenue per citizen, and it's our income taxes, and it's just all kinds of sad numbers. The ones I want to focus on is the question you asked, again, mwah, um, U.S. national debt as of yesterday. We were, all, we're almost at $31 trillion. Folks, that's an awful lot of money. So let's break it down to what we mean. So you people who had COVID babies, your cute little COVID babies, yeah, their, their debt per citizen, let's break that down, is $92,738 as of yesterday. That's their debt. Your debt as a taxpayer is only $245,191. How do you feel so far? And this doesn't include the unfundeds, you see. This is just what we're spending. See, I'm a big fan that, that we should have a plan for recouping this. And here's, here's the other part of the concern. Back in the 1960s, our debt, our, our debt to GDP ratio down here, I'll, I'll show you, down here, was at 52.4% in 1960. And then in 1980, it was 34.6%. In 2000, it was 56. Now look at where we are. Now, all of you can do math. So I love you so much. You may be the only people in DC who can. <laughs> no? All right. I thought that was hilarious. I worked on that last night. <laughs> and I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun if we could take your COVID babies and see what their debt's going to be when they go into first grade? What would it be if we fast forwarded four years, four years as of yesterday, and here it is. This is on our current spending path. We're over 41 trillion, and each one of your COVID babies is now 119,517. Your debt's only $301,000. And our, our debt to GDP ratio jumps up to almost 170%. Yeah, the national debt keeps me awake at night. It's worrisome because I don't see us taking the right action to fix this problem. Um, and how do we compare to other leading nations? That was a question. Poorly. Poorly. Um, right now, what's saving us against other nations is the value of the dollar, which is still quite strong. And it's, uh, however, uh, interestingly enough, Myanmar this morning announced that they were adjusting the currency in their country to not only align with the dollar, but also the ruble. What? So that to me was uh, concerning. Um, and I got the question, what's the corresponding cost to the environment of each of the energy production elements? I have no idea. Um, I know there's people who study that. It's just not me. Um, why did the national debt go down in the 80s? Well, remember, we came off that fun period of stagflation under Paul Volcker. And spend it, we had stagflation, which meant the price of things went up, inflation went up, and then the economy stalled. But it also meant that government expenditures also slowed down a lot, and that's what saved us. Does the debt per taxpayer include corporations? No, and thank you for asking that clarifying question. So folks, here's the problem. A lot of people feel like they're at the end of their rope, and it's up to us to figure out what to do about it, because the uncertainty with everything going on around us is exhausting.
So what do we have to do? Well, let's focus on the people. Let's just focus for a little bit on the people. Attract, recruit, retain, mentor, manage, evolve, and develop our current and next generation of leaders because we can control that. And then we focus on the people we're going to accelerate into the curve. For a lot of people, when they get a lot of bad news, and you've seen this before, you go in to work with somebody and they just freeze like deer in the headlights on a mountain road at night, always freezing. Or they simply throw up their hands and say, I don't know what to do, so I'm not going to do anything. We've got to be accelerating into the curve. We've got to be hitting the gas. Anybody here a NASCAR fan? Somebody's got to be a NASCAR fan. NASCAR fans, anybody? Not one person in this room is a NASCAR fan. OK, thank you, ma'am. You can just make stuff up. I don't even care. I thank you for playing. You get a prize. You're my favorite. Do you have a driver? If you don't, that's OK. I'll make one up for you. Good answer. Yeah, um, okay, good answer. So Junior, Dale Earnhardt Jr., you've heard of him? Okay, good, thank you so much. You're, you're my favorite. Thank you. So the difference between Dale Earnhardt Jr. as a professional driver and us is not just the fact that you've got his, his number eight and 88 tattooed on your arm. That's a whole different thing. The difference is he knows that during uncertain times, when they're getting ready to head into a banked part of the course, they accelerate. For a lot of our people, we took our foot off the gas. We froze. We've got to accelerate. For many people, when they see an uncertain mountain road, they slow down. Stop it. We need your business growth to be better than it's ever been. We need you to be even better leaders. We need you to be better educating your customers and clients. Because the situation we've been in for the last couple years was different because it affected the whole world. And many of your organizations and your companies have global presence, which is huge which is huge. So there's six stages of any crisis, challenge, or change. And it does not matter if it is a pandemic, if it is a leadership change, or if it is a software update. By the way, you folks who do software updates, I just want to point out, yeah, your people, they're not paying so much attention to you when you're doing that software update because they didn't do the last one. They're still using Excel spreadsheets. They haven't done the last one, uh, so there's that. In the very first stage, it's oh no, oh no the rejection stage. Um, again, military style, these all begin with the same letter of the alphabet, they all begin with an R. The rejection stage is the stage one of any crisis, challenge, or change. So during COVID, it may have been, oh, it's not that bad, it won't really affect me. Uh -huh. Head in the sand, but oh no. Stage two is where we start putting Band-Aid fixes on things. The recognition, hey, I need to pay attention to this. And during COVID, it might be, oh, I'll save money on commuting. I can wear sweatpants during the day, or, or yoga pants, or short pants, or no pants. I saw you, sir. I saw you. And then we said, you know, I'll have to work from home. I get to work from home. You know, for the folks in this room, that's probably a great place. But folks, for a lot of people, home isn't a great place. Maybe there's not enough bandwidth, both physical, space-wise, and Wi-Fi. Maybe there's not enough food. Maybe there's not air conditioning or heat. Maybe there's a violent situation. We don't know. So when we say work from home and expect the same level of productivity, in the short run, that may or may not be doable. It may or may not be a reality. And for us, working from home is probably great. But for a lot of people, not so great. And then I don't know about you, but you know, that idea of I'll have more time with family sounded good. <laughs> and Harold, you may have heard what I did. Baby, I love you, but how can I miss you if you never go away? All right, so, there's, so then we figured this out. We figured out how to do Zoom calls with a dog on our lap at the kitchen table. And then we figured out how to do fourth grade math while we're running in between our actual numbers and we're going, this fourth grade math stuff seems harder than it was before. And I've got degrees in these things. And then we figured out how our COVID babies could be our business managers and they're very, very cute. Also unproductive. And then this pushed us into the realization phase. And in the realization phase, we knew we had to step it up at home and at work. And because it's resource allocation, and some of us got tired, but we need more leadership more often with more specificity, more communication, with shorter emails that were more directive in nature. Now, directive in nature. How many of you have ever been accused of being a little bit too direct for the people around you? Mm-hmm. During times of uncertainty, people need more guidance and direction, and they need it more often. So it's OK to do that, but tell the team you're going to do it that way. So some of us also figured out we need a better technology. These were huge expenditures for certain teams. So that may be that business investment where you needed better technology. And then you had to step it up. This is the realization phase. This is going to go on. We have to deal with it. And then we figured this out. We're copacetic. We've got this. <sighs> Namaste. We got this. Stage four, stage four is resolution. 
We can support each other. We can help each other. We can get through this. You know what she started doing then? She started calling each other, saying, what are we going to do about this? And let's share some ideas. And I know I work for you know, this company and you work for that company, but let's talk about what we're going to do well. And you started to figure out how to support each other, which is why many of you are here and why some of you at home, you're tuning in because maybe you couldn't be here, but you want to be part of this. And it's so critical that you are. And then this pushed us into these first four stages that many people stayed in, and this was frustrating for some of you, because it's myopic. In the first four stages, it's all about me, my job, my kids, my house, my little league team, my community. And for many of your people, they stayed mired in these first four stages like an endless PowerPoint loop. And they never break out of it. And for a lot of you, it was frustrating because you very quickly moved yourself into stage five, which is the reality stage. Got it. This is reality. Got it. I know I need to deal with this. Got it. We can do this because I know what I have to do. Yeah, things are going to be more difficult. Yeah, things are going to have to change. Got it. And it pushed you into the realignment phase, which is stage six, which is where leaders operate. First and foremost, how do we support our people? And then how do we work cooperatively with our competition? That's how leaders think. We say, you know what? I had stuff over here. I wasn't using it. Y'all can have my stuff. Or we've got a group of people getting together and let's share good ideas. Work cooperatively with the other people from your best competition because they're your best competition for a reason. Where can I improve my processes? I've got some people say, well, I just can't wait to get back to 2019. Are you kidding me? Winston Churchill was the one who said, don't waste a good crisis. We cannot waste a good crisis. We cannot go back to the old way of doing things that did not serve us well. And what do we need to do differently moving forward? And how does this change my leadership? And how does this change my strategy? And how can I equip my teams to manage change well? Because most people don't. The habenula of our brain pushes back against change. So for most people, you think, well, why can't you figure this out? So hang on, I'll help you. Real fast, it's a fun thing. I like to wander around, as you know. This side of the room, I want you to come up with words that describe people who do not like change. You don't even have to talk to each other. You don't even have to look at each other. I'm just going to ask you in like 20 seconds. This side of the room, think of words that describe people who do like change. You have like 15 seconds, ready, set, go. Now I'm wandering over here and you're thinking, oh God, please help her not come over to my table. I know what you're thinking, I get that. Okay, give me words that describe people who don't like change. Stubborn, Stubborn. thank you, yep. Flexible. Inflexible. Stagnating. 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 Luddites. Luddites, very nice. Stuck. Stuck. Ignorant. Ignorant, ooh, back table. Fearful. What? Fearful. Fearful, very nice, over here. Stagnant, Stagnant. good, over here. Lazy, Lazy. very nice. Disengage, beautiful, up here. Stale, old, fashioned, he added fashioned. Thank you. All right, this side of the room. Describe people who do like change. Go, over here. Fun, Fun. innovative. Adaptable. Adaptable, flexible. Creative, flexible. All you people in the back row, I can find you. I can walk this way. You, know, you didn't think I could do it, but I can find you people. Give me some words, back row. Progressive. Progressive. Courageous, nice. He had progressive too. He's like, yeah, whatever they said. All you people up here. Adaptive, very nice. Curious, very nice. Good, good, good. What else? Versatile, very nice. Good, over here. Energized. Resilient. Then ask your team what side of the room do you want to be on. And then ask them, how can I help you go from this to that? Help your people manage change because it's not that they're stubborn necessarily. It's not that they don't want to change. Their brain actually works against them. So what you got to do is help the habenula, the part of the brain go, oh, what's in it for me? And you go, you know, it's going to be better if we do this. And then your habenula goes, oh, okay, why didn't you say that in the first place? Boom. It's like flipping a switch, but you have to decide. And that's what's really helpful. And then where do we allocate those scarce resources? What needs to happen next? And how do we stay focused when everything around us is chaotic and crazy? And how do we position ourselves for the future? See, my leaders stay in here. And it's resource allocation, and it's paying attention to what you need to pay attention to. But it's asking the question. So one of my challenges for you is what if you just took one of these questions and focused on this between now and the end of the year? How would that improve your ROI, what could you then do? And so it's another acronym and it's pivot, and I'm sorry because I know we're all sick to death of the word, but when you get to those moments of indecision, I've just got about um, uh, seven minutes left, think about the word pivot and help your people reinvigorate themselves with a sense of purpose. McKinsey came out with about a 50-page report, I've summarized it for you, in five bullet points. 
People desperately feel like their work needs to matter. When everything around them is uncertain, they need to hang on to certainty, and that is purpose. You know where they get that purpose? You. You. They need to have interpersonal connections at work. Many times my employers, when we survey them, they view their employees as more transactional. And as employees, we think of this as being very relational. So we've got to make that shift. Think about those of you who made the decision to get married. How long was that? How long did you know that person before you decided to actually get married, take that legal step? Throw out some numbers. Four years, very nice. Eight years, good. Yeah, these are some long job interviews. <laughs> and think about the job you have right now, and they interviewed you for 30 minutes, and they said, you'll do. And that worked out pretty well for you. But you spend more time awake with the people you had a 30-minute interview with than the person you interviewed for eight years awake. So this is what this looks like. And then we've got to have a sense of shared identity. There's a reason, so I'm going to deconstruct a couple things. There's a reason I asked where the other veterans were in the room. Also because I like to know where you are, also I would like to thank you all, but also you're my biggest critics because we've all been trained the same. Then I asked where the dog people are. I'm trying to create those connections. And then I asked the cat people. So we're just trying to create connections. And we try to do that at the networking events that are woven into this event because connections are huge and we've got to have those. And then we've got to feel a sense of being valued and respected and listened to and cared about at work. People need this. And we think it, a lot of my, um, my more senior folks kind of push back against the woohoo part of this. I said, but it's good productivity. It's good, it's good for your business to care about your people. And I did have one CEO who said, well, I can just fake that, right? I'd really appreciate it if you didn't. That would be great. And they want meaningful moments, not just the same. And this is why many of you are here, because it creates meaningful moments and it helps you move forward. When we're trying to land a plane on a carrier deck, you're pretty focused on what's going on right at that moment. It creates that sense of purpose. But sometimes we need to give people reminders. This is on the back of my dog shampoo bottle, and it says, remember to eliminate all escape routes well in advance. A tip, once your pet is slippery wet, he or she is suddenly smarter and faster than you. <laughs> you already knew this. It's kind of the same with children. You know this, but they're still going to remind you, folks, it's okay to give people around you reminders. And then the I is making sure that you are prepared to influence and inspire people every single day when you show up. Some people are motivated by a paycheck. Some people are motivated truly by the people around them. And some people just want to be around their cats and dogs. The I is to influence and inspire people the best way possible. The V is volatility. Assess the volatility, again, of the people around you. When I was, I, I was guilty of this too. I'd walk around and go, how you doing? Good, great, fine. It's what I got. When we're operating Navy ships, and my swell guy, you know, because um, you were on one of the ones in the back here doing this, the folks in the back, um, they're there just in case things go badly. And it's really critical because that happens when you're launching planes, and we're not doing this right now on this carrier deck. But when you're doing a lot of maneuvers at sea, lots of things can go wrong, and the costs are high. So the volatility, good, great, fine, not good enough. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being absolutely fantastic and 1 being really bad, where are you right now with everything going on around you? That's going to give you a number. If somebody says, I'm an 8, great. What can you do to go from an 8 to a 9? Oh, I could just do this. Okay, that's great. Or if somebody says, I'm a 3 or a 4, whoa, that's an all stop. That means they need my attention right now. So we've got to help people with this sense of purpose. This is when we launch planes off carrier decks. By the way, we don't dress people in different colored shirts because, ooh, Skittles. That would be whimsical fun. We do it because the jerseys represent the job they're doing. I can, from the bridge, tell in an instant, do I have the right plane movers, my maintainers, my ordnance people, my fuelers? In one second, where's my ops boss? Colors are fast. And when you're launching planes off a of carrier deck, and you can tell they're my, my planes because they're old, um, it's dangerous work. And we've got, we get people up close and personal with jet engines. Did you, those of you who've ever dealt in medical, did you know there's an ICD-10 code for being sucked into a jet engine? Did you know that? Oh, silence, yeah, okay, this is funnier. So there's an ICD-10 code for being sucked into a jet engine second time. <laughs> See, that's, okay, that's pretty, you're like, you didn't learn this the first time, okay. Now keep in mind, folks, the average age on board one of my, and they're my aircraft carriers, is 19 and a half years old. 19 and a half. 
that's who's out there doing this job. So assessing the volatility is important. Um, you're getting a series of five-minute plans I think should be helpful to you. This, for example, is a five-minute conflict resolution plan. In the conflict resolution plan, it's ways to get people on the same page when it comes time to what it is we need to be doing. You're getting like 15 of them. I hope you like them, and I'm going to show you where to do this. The O is the, opportun is the opportunities that come up that we have to find, and when we find the opportunities, we have to address those opportunities. So the two questions I want to direct your attention to is, in a year, what will we say we are glad that we had this challenge? What will we say we did well? What will we say we're proud of? And that we've got this legacy that we left because we had this challenge. Um, tools, training, technology. The T in pivot is making sure we provide people with the things they need to do their job effectively. And so sometimes we cut corners on things that don't make sense because it costs more resources in the end. I got to uh, talk to some firefighters very recently. And I said, why do you do it? Why do you go into a burning building when the rest of us run out of the burning building? And overwhelmingly, they said, because we trust our gear, we trust our training, and we trust our leadership. So for how many of your people would they run into the burning building because you said so? Um, and then the five-minute leadership promotion plan. This is something you can, again, print out with your folks. Address a question. Help them be more engaged. Help them see that there's a career path where you are. The leadership improvement plan does a similar thing. This is something you can start with with you. If you were to, if you say, you know, I'm, I kind of work remotely. I'm not really sure what to do to improve my own situation. This might be something to pay attention to. Um, so I want to introduce you very quickly to my siblings. I really like them. Um, we're very close. Um, my sister is in the far side, um, your left side. She she was the Air Force uh, officer, she was comms officer, she married a naval officer, a maintenance guy. My older brother was the, was the Marine helicopter pilot in the family. Um, he married a Navy gal. Then there's me, I married a Force Recon Marine. Um, and then my younger brother was a Navy pilot. Uh-huh, he married a school teacher. And we are wildly confused by her. Wildly confused by her. And, and she's from Alabama, she's super cute and super sweet, and she's, she's that first grade teacher that you want for your little COVID baby. Like she is the one, her class is decorated like Disneyland, and the children love her, and she, she loves them, and it's clear, and everything she does, she's wildly patient. I said, how do you do it? And she said, I have to teach the way they learn. Oh. See, when you're used to dealing with numbers, sometimes the people you're talking to aren't. And sometimes the people you're talking to see, they're not hearing what you're saying. Because some people think you're really scary. So I met y'all, and you're nice. Like, you're a nice group of people. But some people are scared when they have conversation with you, and they're not hearing it. So we have to communicate in a way that works for them. And if you're just going to be good at one leadership trait, please, please, please be great at communication. Because it overrides so many other things. And communicate in a way that works for them, not us. So how do we do that? Well, OK, back to this. Now do you believe me? Come on. Come on. Grab your phone. Scan. Still no? Wow. All right. You've been trained so well. I'm so impressed. All right. So uh, this is where you're going to put your mask on before other people's masks go on. Um, this is where your leader's blind spot assessment lives. You're going you're gonna to go below the frogs. There's a blue line. It takes about 90 seconds. I really encourage you to do it today while you're still thinking about it. And this gives you, in 90 seconds, your superpowers. It took me about two and a half years to put this together, and a part of that was because I needed to make sure that it was accurate. So go ahead, text the word dog to 66866. Go ahead, take a picture of this slide. Uh, or you can just go directly to this site. Go directly to this site. And this is going to give you this vault of materials. And this is where I'm going to end. Folks, we need you. We need better leadership. We need people who understand numbers. We need people who understand the economy. We need people who are great at their jobs. And folks, there's a great Hawaiian word that after spending a day and a half with you all, it came to mind, and the word is kina ole. The word kina ole means doing the right thing at the right time with the right spirit to the right person every time. And that's you. So folks, I'm turning back over to Harold. Thank you all for being here. If you've got any questions or I didn't answer them, I will be focusing on that. Thank you, folks. <laughs>